Greetings, everyone, and thank you all so much for joining us today. Uh, my name is Luke Hansen, and I'm a program manager with the University of Alabama at Birmingham School of Public Health's Office of Public Health Practice. And it's my pleasure today to welcome you to our webinar, Infection Prevention, What Is It? Can It Really Help Protect Us From pathog Pathogens? Our, is, uh, our featured speaker is Mary Duncan, Senior Director of Infection Prevention at the University of Alabama Birmingham Health System. And this webinar is made possible by the Alabama Regional Center for Infection Prevention and Control Training and Technical Assistance, or much short, more shortly, ARC-IPC. The ARC-IPC was established to meet the consultation and support service needs surrounding infection prevention and control throughout the state of Alabama. The center is a collaborative effort of the Alabama Department of Public Health's Infectious Disease and Outbreaks Division, as well as the University of Alabama at Birmingham. ARC-IPC provides training and technical assistance to infection prevention and control and public health professionals in areas needed to detect, respond to, control, and prevent infectious disease outbreaks. And you can learn more about the center, view and listen to past trainings, webinars, and podcasts, uh, request training and technical assistance, and view infection prevention and control resources at our website. That's uab.edu slash arcipc. You can also email arcipc at uab.edu with any questions you might have um, to stay up to date about future trainings by signing up for our newsletter, which you can do on the homepage of our website. And again, all that information is listed right there for you. We also would like to take a moment just to thank our other co-sponsors for this event, and that's the Deep South Center for Occupational Health and Safety and the Region 4 Public Health Training Center. And you can learn more about both of those organizations um, through their websites listed here. Uh, while we have a minute, we'd like to ask you to join us for our upcoming webinar with Dr. Katrine Wallace, Misinformation as a Risk Factor During the COVID-19 Pandemic. And so this is going to focus on how misinformation has been really a key risk factor throughout the pandemic, leading to more disease and death from COVID-19. Uh, Dr. Wallace from the University of Illinois at Chicago School of Public Health is an epidemiologist and social media science communicator who debunks misinformation and false claims about COVID-19 and vaccines. Um, in her talk, she'll discuss the difference between misinformation and disinformation, the techniques that people use to mislead, why misinformation goes so viral on social media, and how viral misinformation is negatively affecting the public's health. The webinar will also be presented by the Archive PC and co-sponsored by the Region 4 Public Health Training Center. And so that one will be held on April 26th at 12 p.m. Central Standard Time. So again, we hope you'll join us. Uh, continuing education credits have been approved for nurses by the Deep South Center for Occupational Health and Safety for this program. In order to receive those credits, you need to register for the training, watch the entire program, and complete the evaluation following the program. And then upon completion of the evaluation, you'll be redirected to the LM and Nursing CEU request form, which you'll also need to complete. CEUs are going to be awarded by the Deep South Center for Occupational Health and Safety, and you do not have to submit directly to the Alabama Board of Nursing. CEUs for this program will expire on March 22nd, 2023. And then if you have any questions or issues, uh, please just email us directly at archipc at uab.edu, and I will copy and paste that address into the chat box as well. And so finally, it is my pleasure to introduce our speaker today. Um, Mary Duncan is an experienced certified infection preventionist who spent the last 18 years implementing best practices at various facilities to prevent infections in patients. She is currently serving as the Senior Director of Infection Prevention at the University of Alabama Birmingham Health System, which is an over 1100 bed level one trauma center here in the city of Birmingham, Alabama. Through her passion and innovative approaches, she strives to decrease infections by working with frontline staff to make sure they're educated on best practices and have access to the tools they need to do the right thing. Mary is skilled in the ability to listen and identify issues or problem areas and form innovative solutions that increase the safety for both patients and staff. And so without further ado, I will stop sharing my screen and turn it over to Mary. So thank you for joining. I'm so honored to be part of this series. So I really have learned a lot from the previous speakers, um, you know, from how COVID came about and how it spread, the right kind of masks that we're supposed to be wearing. Um, how do we use data to really understand the impact of diseases and then how to have difficult conversations in a productive way. And I'm really looking forward to the, the next one about the, the fake news and how all that spread because I think we all know that has been huge over the past couple of years. Um, I'm hoping that my presentation can really help build on the foundation that's been created and that I can help you understand how the diseases are spread and what we can do to protect ourselves. So throughout the next um, hour, um, I'm going to define some basic terminology around infection prevention, infectious disease, and a lot of these terms you probably have heard over the past couple of years. 
Um, I'll also describe the evolution of infection prevention with the hope that it'll shed some light on how the key infection prevention measures were developed. And then I'll explain how the infection prevention measures work to protect us. And then finally, identify some potential future trends in infection prevention. So only wear a mask if you're in the hospital. Wear masks all the time. Social distancing, stay at home orders. Only test these people, flatten the curve. Wear an N95, asymptomatic spread, surge, quarantine, isolate. The past couple of years have really been a roller coaster. But believe it or not, we have learned so much that will help us prevent future pandemics. So as an infection preventionist, I realize that I view the pandemic with different lenses than someone who doesn't have a medical background. And this really became apparent fairly early on in 2020 when information was coming out about this new virus, COVID-19, and the mixed messages that were coming out from multiple different agencies. I saw how confused my family and friends were and how quickly they lost faith in the people that they thought they could trust. So the government, the CDC, the World Health Organization, and even their doctors. And while I felt some of this frustration, I had a knowledge base about how diseases are spread and key components of how to prevent this spread. So this enabled me to trust that the science would eventually point us in the right direction. In the meantime, I understood the measures that were being put in place to protect the public, such as masking, social distancing, quarantine, cleaning surfaces, and hand hygiene, and really why they were being implemented. So the war between humans and pathogens, it's not a new one. I mean, for centuries, humans have endured infectious disease outbreaks and pandemics. And even in today's world, millions of people will die from um, an infectious pathogen every year. And the concept of infection prevention, however, it's relatively new in the grand scheme of things. Um, and it's really evolved over the past um, half century or so. And it started out as being called infection control because these were measures that were put in place to stop the spread of disease. And then as research around how pathogens are spread um, became apparent, people really re started to realize that they could prevent infection if they implemented certain strategies. So the common term became infection prevention and control. And then a little over a decade ago, there was a big push to change it to infection prevention so that there was an increased focus on preventing an infection before it even happened. The CDC and, WHO and World Health Organization, their definitions focus mainly on preventing infections in the healthcare setting. Um, something about the World Health Organization definition that I really like is that it talks about um, infection prevention and control is universally relevant to every health worker and every patient at every care interaction. But for my presentation, I'll not, I'm not gonna be focusing mainly on healthcare this setting. Um, my goal is really to inform you about how pathogens are spread and general ways to mitigate this spread. Therefore, I'm gonna use a very broad definition of infection prevention. So I define it as actions that a person can take to prevent a pathogen from entering the body and causing disease. So this is gonna be stuff as like hand hygiene, wearing a mask, doing social distancing, cleaning surfaces and devices, our food and water safety, um, controlling pests so they can't become vectors, um, vaccination, quarantine, isolation, and, and PPE, our personal protective equipment. So why do you need infection prevention? So up until um, the early 1900s, outbreaks of infectious diseases was a normal occurrence due to overcrowding in cities and non-existent public water supplies and waste disposal systems. There were repeated outbreaks of cholera, dysentery, tuberculosis, typhoid, influenza, yellow fever, smallpox, malaria, all of these um, occurred on a regular basis. And in fact, about 25% of children didn't even make it to the age of 14 due to um, infectious diseases. Now, there were some key discoveries that really helped pave the road to prevent infections. Um, the first one, in, in 1861, Louis Pasteur published his germ theory after he saw that microorganisms germinating are growing in a liquid through his microscope. And he had a broth that, you know, he left open the air, saw that it had growth on it. Then he heated that broth, which killed um, whatever was in there and it became a pure broth again, and then left a beaker open. And that when he noticed, um, started to grow things again. But if that beaker was closed, there was no growth. So this 
in his, um, in his work, he proved that there was a link between germs and disease. And he had um, the germ theory, which had four basic principles, which is the air contains living microorganisms. The microbes can be killed by heating them. Microbes in the air cause decay and microbes are not evenly distributed in the air. So up until this time, people believed that dis diseases were caused by foul orders or miasma that arose from the ground and caused epidemics. Or they believed that evil spirits could cause a person to become ill. So ultimately, the germ theory helped change the way that doctors and people thought of, reacted to, and prevented diseases. And additionally, it helped the public health officials keep illnesses and germs from spreading throughout communities. And then in 1876, Robert Koch further promoted that diseases could be prevented through his study of anthrax, where he proved that a bacterium, a specific bacterium could be um, a specific infectious agent. And this is shown in Koch's postulates, which show that the organism must be constantly present in the diseased tissue. The organism must be isolated um, by a pure culture. And then that culture, must be induced disease when injected into an experimental animal. And then you have to be able to isolate that same organism um, from that diseased animal. And based on these discoveries, public health departments were created to control disease through improvements in sanitation and hygiene. And then the discovery of antibiotics and the implementation of universal childhood vaccination programs further paved the road to preventing infections. Now, in order to prevent infections, it's really important that you know what causes them and how they're spread. So this is best illustrated in the model of the chain of transmission, which consists of an infectious agent or the pathogen, a reservoir for that pathogen to multiply and thrive in, a portal of exit for the pathogen to be released into the environment, a mode of transmission for the pathogen to travel, and then a portal of entry for the pathogen to enter the new host, and also a susceptible host for the pathogen to live in. So this is an excellent model to map, map, out, map out how to prevent infections. So if you can define each of these key links, then you can identify how best to stop the organism from spreading. So we'll take a look at each of these links in the chain. And as I go through these, be thinking about what measures could be implemented to break the chain. So we always have to start with an infectious agent. So this can be a virus such as COVID-19, influenza, herpes, RSV, or norovirus. It can also be a bacteria such as Staph aureus, Pseudomonas, E. coli, um, or Streptococcus, a fungus such as a Canada, Histopiasmosis, Aspergillus, ringworm, or it can be a parasite such as a pinworm or a Giardia. And then since each agent has a different genetic makeup, it's important to know key characteristics of the agent to determine its ability to cause infection. So for example, the virulence, so what's the ability to grow and, and multiply? What's its infectivity or the ability to enter the tissues? Um, pathogenicity, so how capable is this um, pathogen in causing a disease? What's the duration of exposure? So the length of time that a person has to be exposed to this organism before it can enter the, the new host and cause disease. What's the size of the inoculum? So is it just a couple of organisms or do you need a huge exposure um, to cause disease? You know, when you think of Ebola, it doesn't take many of the pathogens to cause that disease. And then population immunity um, is important. So as a community of naive population, like if you think of the entire world as COVID has hit, we have not experienced this before. So we're all um, at risk of it. Um, or is an evolved agent where people maybe have um, vaccinations or some immunity against it. So hopefully when I was mentioning each of the examples, um, you were thinking about where they come from or where they live. And this is known as their reservoir. So if the reservoir is a human, they can be symptomatic as in the case of like an active measles infection or an infected wound. Or the human can be an asymptomatic or colonized with the pathogen. So for example, people may have Staph aureus that lives on their skin or lives in their nose, but it's not really causing an infection. The reservoir could also be an animal such as you know, rats who carried bubonic plague uh, mosquitoes who can carry malaria or the West Nile virus, or animals um, such as um, wild animals that carry rabies. 
And many infectious agents also live in the environment, such as histoplasmosis that lives in birds or bat droppings, um, Legionella that can be in untreated water tanks, or C. diff, um, or in some of our other multidrug resistant organisms that can live in the hospital and on surfaces. So once you know where the organism lives, then it's easier to figure out how it can leave, leave that reservoir. So for humans, the most common exit is a for a respiratory pathogen um, is the respiratory tract. So influenza, COVID-19, TB, all those are being expelled through the respiratory tract. Um, the feces is common for such pathogens as C. diff um, or cholera and a lot of our gram-negative organisms that we see. Skin lesions or wounds are portals of exit for pathogens such as Staph aureus um, or scabies. And then blood or body fluids can be the portal of exit for our bloodborne pathogens, HIV, hepatitis B, hepatitis C. And then once a pathogen is out of its reservoir, there needs to be a mode of transmission to the new host. So this can happen in a multitude of different, multitude of different ways. So it can be a direct contact with the organism at the portal of exit and the new host. So this would happen with your skin-to-skin -skin contact, such as a Staph aureus, um, or a scabies transfer, or through kissing when we think of mononucleosis, or contact with the soil or other vegetation that harbors the organisms, so such as shoveling bird droppings um, that are infected with histoplasmosis and being able to release that up into the air. It can also occur by droplet spread through the spray of a person coughing or sneezing. So this happens in a lot of our respiratory viruses, rhinovirus and influenza, and um, even COVID. So as, as people are, are coughing and sneezing, they blow out um, droplets that can get into the air. And then there can also be indirect transmission. So this could occur through the airborne route. So when an infectious agent is um, put out into the air and then it's carried by dust or droplet nuclei in the air um, or to different areas. So an examples of this are gonna be measles, chicken pox, tuberculosis, um, where you think of highly infectious organisms that are in the air. It can also be by inanimate objects, such as doorknobs, um, hard surfaces, hands are very common, or contaminated food or water, um, or by our blood. And then finally, it can be transmitted by vectors, such as mosquitoes um, that carry malaria or West Nile, fleas can carry plague, or ticks that can carry um, Rocky Mountain spotted fever or something like that. Now, if the pathogen was lucky enough to find a good reservoir where it can grow and live, and then it decided it was time to leave, to exit, because it found a mode of transmission to move on, then it must now find a portal of entry where it can enter its new host. So pathogens are gonna be looking to enter um, the new host through the respiratory tract, through your eyes, through the fecal oral route, or um, by blood. And then by the, the most important part of the whole chain of transmission is really that the pathogen must enter a susceptible host. So this means that the pathogen is able to live and multiply in the new host. And this can be by colonization where the pathogen lives in the tissues but isn't causing um, disease, such as the Staph aureus that we talked about earlier that's living in the nose and not causing infection, or by an active infection where the host actually displays symptoms of active disease such as, as COVID-19, where you get a lot of the respiratory issues. Now, lucky for us, the human body has been designed to protect itself from foreign invaders. So we have skin that protects um, our, our innards. Um, we have tears that can flush out any pathogens that are potentially landing in our eyes. We have mucus and cilia in the respiratory tract that are constantly you know, working to move things out of the body. Um, the gastric acid in our stomach that potentially can um, kill pathogens um, in, if it gets into our, our stomach. But we also have our microbiome, which has a lot of good body, a good bacteria that's on our skin and in our gut that, that can help prevent us from some of these pathogens. And then, of course, our own immune system, um, our white blood cells that can come and kill any pathogens that are entering our body. There's been a lot of research that really is beginning to show that our genetic makeup plays a role in our susceptibility. So people are trying to figure out why do some people and families um, 
get killed by COVID-19, while others really just are asymptomatic carriers or don't contract it at all. And there's recent research that shows that some people have mutations in their genes um, that in, interact with their, or that affect their immune system so that maybe they have super um, killer T cells that really make them immune to this, or they have inborn errors where they don't have the right equipment to um, build the cells that they need to fight off these infections. But we also have immunity to some pathogens due to antibodies. From, um, we can get those either from a vaccine or from a previous infection so that if the pathogen does make it back into our body, um, we have cells that can go out there and attack it before it can take up residence. We also have antimicrobials that can kill the pathogen if it gets through our defenses, such as prophylactic antibiotics. So if a patient is, if a person is exposed to pertussis, um, they may take prophylactic antibiotics, so if some of that pathogen did get into their body, that there's um, antibiotics there that can kill it before it causes an infection. Or pre-op antibiotics, um, maybe before you're having hip surgery, so that there's antibiotics in your tissues when they do that incision. So if any bacteria do get into that wound, um, they can be killed before they can cause an infection. But there's also several factors that make us more susceptible to pathogens, such as malnutrition, um, alcoholism, medications that are su suppress our immune system, so we're immunocompromised, uncontrolled diabetes. Um, and if, when you think about in the healthcare environment, we insert a lot of artificial devices, so um, peripheral IVs, ventral lines, urinary, tract or urinary catheters, um, endotracheal tubes, and all of these bypass our body's normal defenses to prevent pathogens from entering the body. So here's an example of how the chain of infection works. So I've used COVID-19 virus as the pathogen. So the reservoir would be mainly humans, but we know it can also live in animals. Um, the portal of exit is through our respiratory tract when the person coughs, sneezes, talks, sings. Um, the mode of transmission is mainly through direct contact with those droplets or to some extent, some aerosolized particles. And the ability to be transmitted through surfaces is a little bit less common we're finding with COVID-19. And then a portal of entry is gonna be the eyes, nose, and mouth of the new host. And a susceptible host is really any person of any age. So now that we know the chain of transmission, we can look at ways to break that chain and prevent transmission of the pathogen. So the first thing we should do is try to eliminate the infectious agent or the source. And this can be done by giving an antimicrobial to a patient who has an active infection. So treating our wound infections, treating pneumonia. Um, so there's no bacteria or viruses that can, there are no bacteria that can go out into the environment. You can also quarantine an exposed individual during the incubation period so that that person was to develop an infection. There would be no, no place for it to spread to. Um, isolating a symptomatic person so there's no new host that it can infect. Um, a very effective strategy is to eliminate, eliminate the reservoir by cleaning the surface or the piece of equipment that the pathogen may be living on using um, an approved or a really good disinfectant that will kill those viruses and bacteria. And then testing and active surveillance is also an effective way to stop the spread of pathogens. So this helps us identify who our reservoirs are that may be asymptomatic spreaders. So again, when we think about that Staph aureus carrier or with COVID, we've learned that there's a lot of asymptomatic um, people walking around that um, can be spreading the, the virus as well as our MDRO colonized people. And then if we haven't been able to um, kill the, the reservoir, then we need to move the, um, to the next link in the chain, which is interrupting the portal of exit. So this can be done by respiratory hygiene or cough etiquette. So making sure that if somebody's coughing or sneezing that they're doing it into um, their elbow or into a tissue and to prevent those from, from being spewed into that environment. Um, we found with COVID that masking our, the source person is very effective in reducing the transmission of COVID because they aren't able to get those droplets out into the air. Keeping wounds clean and covered, so keeping that drainage from um, getting out that could potentially spread some of the bacteria. 
and then containing body fluids such as diarrhea so it doesn't get into the environment. And if we haven't been successful yet, then we need to interrupt the mode of transmission. And this is really where the majority of infection prevention efforts have been placed. So standard precautions are an essential practice to prevent the spread of disease. And I'll go over that a little bit more in the next slide. And then the second level is transmission-based precautions. Um, and these are used for patients that may be infected or colonized with certain infectious agents for which additional precautions are needed to prevent transmission. So for example, droplet precautions would be used for someone who has influenza. Um, so since we know flu is spread by the droplets, anybody that enters the room would be required to wear a mask to prevent the droplets from the patient hitting our um, mouth or our nose. Um, and then if they're close enough within three to six feet, they would wear eye protection to protect their eyes. And of course, hand hygiene is the most um, important measure to break the chain of direct transmission. So if we remove pathogens from our hands, we really can't pass them on to other people or even uh, inoculate ourselves. Cleaning surfaces with an effective disinfectant to prevent the spread when another person encounters that surface is important um, in stopping the spread. And over the past couple of years, we've learned how important adequate ventilation is to ensure that pathogens are not spread by the air. So they're being filtered out by good filters or there's enough fresh air coming in to dilute out the, the virus um, to be able to, so it doesn't spread to other people. The standard precautions, and I know I said I'm gonna focus on healthcare, but I think that these are so important because these occur anywhere that you are gonna um, enter the health system. So physicians' offices, um, clinics, surgery centers, um, long-term care facilities, nursing homes, hospitals, um, but even in um, the everyday interactions with people, we use standard precautions. So again, back to hand hygiene, so important to just eliminate the whatever pathogens are in our hands, um, using protective um, personal protective equipment, so gloves, masks, eyewear, um, and we do this now, we know we're all wearing masks all the time to prevent um, coming in contact with a COVID positive person and, and infecting ourselves. Um, respiratory hygiene and cough etiquette, really teaching people to control their secretions when they're coughing and sneezing. Sharp safety, so making sure that there's engineering controls um, on our sharps so that we're not accidentally, accidentally sticking ourselves with needles. Safe injection practices have become huge over the past um, decade. You know, aseptic technique for um, parental um, medications, Mul not using multi-dose dose files on multiple different people, not sharing needles. Um, those are all huge in preventing the spread of diseases. And then cleaning instruments and devices um, so that we have safe um, instruments and devices that we're using on our people and, and um, eliminating any pathogens that could be on there and then cleaning and disinfecting our environmental surfaces. So I cannot do a talk on infection prevention if I didn't acknowledge the founder of hand hygiene, so Ignaz Semmelweis, who discovered the important link between physicians cleaning their hands after performing an autopsy and preventing maternal infections when they're um, give, helping them give birth. However, it's a little bit of a sad story because his peers didn't really believe that they could be the cause for infections and they didn't readily adopt his hand hygiene practices. Um, some of them did, but, but all of them, uh, some of them criticized them um, and didn't believe that it was possible. And it's really amazing to me that almost two centuries later, we're still talking about the importance of hand hygiene and how do we make sure that everyone does it at the right time to prevent infections um, in our patients. So around the same time frame, Florence Nightingale, who I really consider to be one of the first infection preventionists, sh started sharing her belief that cleanliness of the environment was essential to promote healing and general well-being in, of the patient. So through her health of houses, she believed that pure water, pure air, efficient drainage, cleanliness, and light were all essential for a healthy environment. And her environmental theory really helped to shape the hospital design and planning. So separating out patients, um, if, you know, if you think back in the medieval times, they shared beds. There may be, you know, four or five people that were in the same bed um, that could have, you know, one might have smallpox, one might have 
um, a broken leg, one might be delivering a baby, but they all shared the bed. Um, you know, there wasn't a lot of fresh air in there, a lot, no bite, linens weren't changed. So, she, um, and you know, so she really came in, separated out the patients um, in more in open wards that have more space, allowing fresh air to come in, light, floors that could actually be cleaned, and then really stressing the importance of cleaning the hospital um, between patients and on a daily basis. And then her beliefs also helped to change nursing practice. So making sure that people had clean bedding and clean clothing, um, clean wound dressing. So before the, the germ theory came to be, people would just share dressings. They may rinse them out a little bit and then use that dressing to put on, a, on another patient. So it was really obvious to see how um, group A streps spread so rampant in hospitals. Um, but she also believed in wholesome and nourishing food and interacting with the patient. So to really um, make them feel, you know, their mental part was almost as important as taking care of their physical ailments. So um, she was huge in, in changing how we, how we treat patients, how we get them into the hospital. Now the pathogen does find a mode of transmission. There's several things that we can do to block the entry into our body. So we can cover our mouth and our nose with a mask, or wear eye protection, and to prevent the droplets from entering through our eyes. If we have breaks in our skin, making sure that they're clean and that they're covered with a Band-Aid. So if we do come in contact with a pathogen in the um, community that they don't have a mode of entry into our um, body. And then removing any artificial catheters, drains or IV um, or tubes so that our body can protect itself and we don't give these pathogens a direct route into our, into our bodies. And if all the efforts to break the chain fail and the pathogen makes it into our, the new host, then there's several things that we can do to stop the pathogen from causing an infection. So the number one way to protect people from a potential pathogen is through the administration of an effective vaccine. So vaccines have essentially eliminated childhood illnesses that killed or maimed so many children. And I'm really one of the first generations who doesn't know anybody who's had measles, mumps, or polio. And my children's generation is one of the first ones that won't know anybody that's had chickenpox. So the development of an effective um, safe vaccine for COVID is potentially one of the reasons that the death rate has been in the millions and not the tens of millions, um, because we've been able to protect um, people. The discovery of antibiotics has been a game changer as well in terms of fighting these pathogens. However, we need, we've learned pretty quickly that we need to be careful with our antibiotics because the pathogens are smart and they can learn how to um, evade these antibiotics. So antimicrobial stewardship is huge. And the individual's health is so important in protecting them from pathogens. And studies have shown that people who smoked or had uncontrolled diabetes or were obese have worse outcomes um, if they're infected with COVID. And personal hygiene is also important. So removing pathogens from our hands and skins with soap and then making sure that we have good oral hygiene. Both of these will prevent um, reservoirs on our body for the pathogens to live. So as I was talking, I hope you were able to identify strategies to break the chain of transmission at the various stages. So if we go back to our COVID example, you know, with the reservoirs, so doing quarantine and isolating to reduce the number of potential hosts that um, the the virus can live in, cleaning the surfaces, and then again, doing the surveillance and testing so that we know who, who actually has COVID so we can isolate them, um, but also who may be um, asymptomatic carriers so that we can have them quarantine themselves as well. Um, covering your cough and mask of the infected patient um, will potentially um, will stop that portal of exit. Um, mode of transmission, how do we break that? So again, making sure that there's adequate ventilation where we're at. So people saying you know, limit the amount of people in a room, try and do things outdoors, um, you know, working on ventilation systems in the hospital and the schools and restaurants to really make sure that that air is filtered appropriately. Um, masking the infected person. So again, making sure that um, he, they can't spew out those um, particles into the air and then cleaning surfaces. So to prevent the portal of entry, masking and eye protection, um, 
and social distancing. So if there is somebody in your vicinity that, <clears throat> that coughs and goes out three to six feet, that the droplets will fall before it, it reaches the person. Um, but then of course the eye and um, masking all the time because we don't know who out there has COVID or is an asymptomatic. So protecting ourselves all the time with that portal of entry. And then for the susceptible host, so making sure that we're vaccinated, um, that we have good health, that we're eating healthy, that we're getting good sleep, that we're staying clean. We also have some monoclonal antibodies that can help if we do get um, infected with it to help our body fight that virus. Um, and then there's some more, some new um, antivirals that are coming out that can help as well. So this here is a table of 11 serious viral outbreaks that have happened over the past 100 years. And it's important to note that over half of them occurred in the past two decades. Um, and I, you know, I think everybody knows that we're going to start seeing more and more um, viruses and bacteria that are evolving that are going to affect us. So it's important that we learn the lessons that we're learning now to protect ourselves um, in the future. And each of these pandemics has taught us valuable lessons on how to protect ourselves and has led to a lot of new inventions and processes. So through lots of research studies using the chain of transmission model, we've been able to identify the cause of the pathogen, where it lives, the incubation period, the period of infectiousness, how it spread, and then also how to stop the spread of many of these pathogens. <clears throat> and some key changes that were made as the result of these outbreaks include the use of, of personal protective equipment, um, isolation and quarantine strategies to really help stop these outbreaks. When you think of the HIV epidemic in the 1980s, this changed how we treat blood and body fluids. So once it was identified that HIV was spreading through the blood and body fluid of infective individuals, it became a universal practice to wear um, personal protective equipment, mainly gloves, when coming in contact with these fluids. But also as we learned about droplet spread of pertussis and influenza, masks became the norm in hospitals. And hopefully, you know, with the lessons that we're learning with COVID, you know, maybe masks might become more of a norm in society. When you look over at some of the Asian countries that had MERS and SARS, um, they started masking early and have not had um, some of the serious consequences that we have had over here. Um, N95 masks became important for stopping the spread of TB in the hospital setting. So before this, um, in hospitals, if a patient was being and they're being treated with uh, for TB, we found that a lot of the nurses and nursing students would convert over to um, a positive skin test uh, because they weren't uh, uh, protecting themselves appropriately. So N95s have really stopped this transmission within hospitals. Um, gowns have been used to stop the spread of certain pathogens by protecting the healthcare workers' clothes. I think this, you know, we find this especially with um, C diff that we don't want these spores on our clothes. Um, but if you think of higher level of the Ebola outbreaks and you see people over there that wear the Tyvek suits and every surface of their body is covered so that that pathogen can't um, infect us. And then evolution of surveillance has also helped prevent large outbreaks of infections. So health departments and hospitals have systems in place to keep track of certain pathogens. And when certain pathogens are identified, such as a new multi-drug resistant pathogen in the hospital, maybe a new novel influenza virus in the community, um, an increase in the number of foodborne pathogens that we're seeing in our community, then we can really get teams together to identify where that pathogen is coming from and develop mitigation strategies to stop the spread. So this here appeared at a newspaper during the 1918 flu pandemic, an attempt to educate the public on how to protect themselves. And I don't know how well you can see it, but it says, you know, do not take um, any person's breath, keep the mouth and teeth clean, avoid those that cough and sneeze, don't visit poorly ventilated places, keep warm, get fresh air and sunshine, don't use common drinking cups, towels, etc. Cover your mouth when you cough and sneeze, avoid worry, fear and fatigue, stay at home if you have a cold, walk to your work or office, and in sick rooms wear a gauze mask um, like in the illustration. Now, if you compare that to, you know, here's something that was put out by the World Health Organization for COVID-19, you know, there's a lot of the same um, 
examples of what we should be doing, um, you know, maybe word it a little bit different and, um, but basically the recommendations haven't changed in over a hundred years. So signs um, and information sheets similar to this have been created by many different agencies, hospitals, health systems, schools, um, et cetera, in an attempt to educate the public on how to protect themselves. And like I said before, it's very similar, um, but unfortunately the distrust of the science and the anger around mandates that we witnessed during the past couple of years, it also occurred way back with the 1918 um, influenza pandemic. And as these were um, you know, shutting down performances, shutting down public um, transport support systems, um, asking people to wear a mask, um, it riled people up and they, they were angry, um, but we found kind of the same thing. So cities that implemented stricter um, infection prevention uh, measures, masking, closing down things, had less death than other cities that you know, didn't do anything and just let everybody go wherever. So very key lessons that um, we learned then and we're learning again now. Um, and so the question really becomes, why have we not remembered all the lessons that we've learned from these previous outbreaks and the deaths of millions of people? And I think maybe one of the answers is that we need to educate the public on how to prevent an outbreak or pandemic on a regular basis, not just when it's occurring. So preparing for a pandemic should be accepted as a natural thing and a government should provide more funds to public health infrastructure to allow them to do their job, which is to protect the public from disease. So in order to stop a pandemic or an outbreak, we really need to answer these key questions. So what's the potential animal, person, or environmental reservoir? What's the transmission route? Is it contact, such as with Ebola, um, airborne, or droplet? What's the exposure type? Is it through the water, as in the cholera outbreak? Is it in the air, for like a measles outbreak? Um, or is it a vector, you know, with um, Zika and West Nile and the mosquitoes that were causing all of those infections? Is there asymptomatic transmission, a risk? So can people be walking around infected with this and spreading it, but not um, truly showing symptoms? How long is the infectious period? I think this has been key, you know, when we're looking at COVID, how long do we isolate people? Um, you know, is it a couple days or does it last for weeks? What's the transmission rate or how infectious is it? I think that this, um, we've learned a lot about this over the past couple of years too. You know, is there one person that can infect three people or, you know, is one person infects one person? Um, so, uh, you know, as we've learned about Delta and Omicron and Omicron too, you know, how, what is the transmission rate um, and how does that affect the measures that we put in place to protect our, um, the public? And then are there super spreaders? There's with several articles that had come out over the past couple of years of events that you know were super spreader events where you probably had one or two people that were releasing a lot of this virus and infecting a lot of people. Um, and then information is key to mitigating risk to the population. So if you think back over the last couple of years, the research studies that were done and published were all working towards answering these questions so that processes could be created to end the pandemic. So now we know how to stop the spread and end the COVID-19 pandemic. What we're missing is the key infrastructure to be able to get the right information out and stop the dissemination of this fake news and myths and um, what you know people trying to make it political rather than following the science. So what if the public was educated on the chain of transmission and understood basic infection prevention strategies? Would they have been more receptive to the public health guidance around masking and social distancing, quarantine, good ventilation and hand hygiene? So what we know is when the people are in the middle of a crisis, then they're not really open to learning new things. They fall back on what they know or what they think they know and who they think that they trust. And it's very difficult to try to trust a new person when they're just trying to survive. So we must learn this lesson from this horrible pandemic so we have to do a better job of empowering people on how to protect themselves from new pathogens. So as with other pandemics or outbreaks, there've been some great advances that have occurred. 
And I believe the, that there are some key things that will change the road of infection prevention. So we have a new platform to create a safe and effective vaccine. So it's gonna be really interesting to see how this will impact the development of other vaccines or potentially cures for other diseases. And then there's also a focus on creating therapeutics for treat, treating new pathogens um, that may emerge. And of course, we learned how important diagnostic testing is. So we need to focus on how to quickly create a diagnostic test and mass produce it. We've also learned about how important surveillance of pathogens is and the need to quickly notify the people. So I think there'll be an overhaul of how surveillance is done around the world and then create a better early warning um, system. And then personal protective equipment had a lot of challenges. So we didn't have enough gowns and respirators. So we need to create um, personal protective equipment that is not only safe and effective, but also comfortable to wear for hours at a time. I think we've all seen pictures of nurses and doctors who had to wear the N95 masks for hours and hours and had the skin break down around their nose and face. And then we need a national stockpile that can really meet the demand um, if we do have another pandemic or when we have another pandemic. Um, I think that there'll be some great movement in learning how our genetic makeup uh, protects us from pathogen or makes us more susceptible to pathogens. And then this may lead to um, the way to determine who is most at risk so we can um, put further measures in place to protect our more at risk population. And then as I said before, we need to use some innovative approaches to educate the public so that we can gain their trust back and they will be more knowledgeable about when the next pandemic hits. And then I also think that we need to change how we create our policies and guidelines. We need to look at behavior science to identify how to make these more acceptable to the public so that they'll be more likely to follow them. And these are my references. I just finished with this. So learn from the past, prepare for the future, but we really need to perform right now in the moment. All right, Mary, thank you so much. Um, really appreciate anybody who put silver lining on the past couple of years. And so I think that last set of slides in particular was just fantastic. Um, we've got a couple questions coming in, but I just wanna open it up one more time and say either through the chat function um, or the Q&A function, if you have any questions here in the last uh, 10 minutes or so, please get those in. Um, right now, just a, a lot of very solid praise coming in. Uh, I will say before looking at uh, some of those questions that have come in, um, again, this present or this recording will be available on the Archive PC website, and we will be getting a copy of the slides. And if you would like those, just email us at archivepc at uab.edu, and we'll get those sent to you as well. Um, so yeah, all the information was fantastic, but if you missed something or uh, you know somebody else who benefit from it, then please pass that on to them. Um, Mary, one question I had come in, uh, you did touch on this to, to some extent. Um, but do you see masks worn by patients and visitors in hospital and clinic settings as something that's going to continue past the COVID pandemic? And what are your thoughts on that? I know you mentioned, um, you know, kind of the image of some Asian countries and how uh, it's more common over there. I know as, as someone with elderly parents that are more susceptible that they've been wearing a mask more. And I really like seeing that on there. And, but what do you think for those healthcare settings? Um, and I guess any settings kind of more broadly. Um, I can tell you what I hope, <laughs> and I hope that we have learned from this, you know, maybe when cold and flu season, you know, once COVID it becomes more endemic, um, when cold and flu season comes around, that we're in, when we're in crowded spaces or hospitals or people where there's vulnerable people, that people wear, will feel comfortable wearing a mask. Um, I, I think it would be great if some of our um societies would come out and make that recommendation so that it just becomes natural, um, you know, and, and it doesn't become this battle of why are you wearing a mask? That's stupid. You, you look, you know, that doesn't make any sense. So I, I think it's so important that we do learn. Now, do we have to wear it all the time? No, I don't, I don't think so. But when we know that flu's picking up and, um, or COVID comes back around, you know, everybody just put your mask back on. Absolutely. Absolutely. I know, yeah, flu season at the grocery store in particular, it just uh, did feel a little bit safer to have folks masked up and, and things of that sort. Um, I know this is deviating away from masking a little bit, but we did have a question come in from Alan Wyman uh, about vaccination and, you know, to the extent that I know it's speculation, but um, what do you think about additional doses being needed? He mentions a fourth in particular, uh, but just in general, the, the continuance in either boosters or additional dosage or anything like that. 
Um, and again, with that, I think we just have to watch the science and and keep track of, of people. It's a brand new you know platform for this for the mRNA vaccine, um, and I think we really just don't know how our body is going to respond and and how long it's going to last. So, I think we just need to accept the fact that probably eventually we'll, we're going to have to do boosters. And you know, if you think about childhood vaccines, you know, it's just a given that you get these vaccines, and nobody really questions that as much anymore because we know that it's effective. So I think we just have to sit back and let the evidence come to light. And if the science shows that you need another vaccine, then just do it and not have it be this, oh, nobody knows what they're doing and, you know, just, but just accept the science. And, but I, I would imagine that, that probably it'll become, you know, a yearly or twice a year or every other year or something um, vaccine. Yeah, that's a great point about how to normalize it. Like again, polio and those other ones that we just get, you know, from birth at this point. Um, no, that's a great point. Uh, we had a question come in from Christina Flores asking how our surveillance system for diseases can be improved in your mind. You know, I think that there's a lot that's coming out now about looking at waste systems, you know, and, and, checking that to see what viruses are circulating around in the community and then really being able to gauge, um, you know, what measures we may need to do. So I think that it would be important um, for communities to start figuring out how to do that more and test for more pathogens that are out there. But then also, um, you know, these novel viruses that are coming out, you know, if you sit there and think of, of the human spread and climate change and all this other stuff, you know, where we're interacting so much more with um, animals that we didn't before, um, not so much here in the United States, but across the whole world. And, and you look at living conditions and everything, it's just a given that this is going to pop up again. So really having um, surveillance systems or able to ability to check maybe some weird um, in, um, infections that happen over there um, in some of the underserved areas to be able to track is something happening and then be able to sound the alarm quicker than what we did. I mean, I remember, you know, back in 2019, they were talking about, oh, there's something weird going on with this Wuhan, you know, over in Wuhan. And it felt like it take, took a long time to really sound the alarm and get the message out there. I think we need to be quicker at identifying something that look, looks a little strange, getting enough resources to do the testing and then get the message out. That's a great answer. Um, and yeah, it's almost, I want to say lucky, but that it was a coronavirus, which we had so much research on that we could at least put some of that into effect. But in hindsight, wow, what more, what more could we have done there? So yeah, the wastewater example and things similar, it's a, it's a great point moving forward. Um, from Bria Berry, we have social settings appear to be moving to less in-person socialization between individuals. Do you see more of these changes to socializing in the hospital in the near future? And what does that look like as far as engaging the public in the healthcare system? This is what, to my opinion, has been like a roller coaster over the past couple of years with that. Like when we eventually, when we first shut everything down, I'm like, oh no, I miss people. I want to be around people. You know, it'll be fine. Don't worry about it. You know, and then to see, oh my gosh, we're you're in a room with this person, everybody gets sick. Um, so I think, yeah, I think we need to figure out how to get people back together because we've learned so much about this isolation and I think people aren't as productive if they're doing everything by Zoom or, you know, you need that face-to-face -face social interaction. Um, now how to do it safely, I think, you know, we definitely can make it sure that our, our ventilation systems are good, making sure that, you know, we don't go back to where we cram a hundred people into a room that really only seats like 50 people um, to make sure that there's enough space. Um, and then, during cold and flu season or whatever, you know, wear a mask or, you know, maybe if there's high prevalence of something to go back and, you know, do the, the Zoom calls and the not in-person meetings. But I think definitely we do need to get people back together. Are there any final questions um, either in the chat or in the Q&A? Uh, a lot of thank yous and great presentations still coming in. We always love to see that. Um, Mary, I can say this is one of our highest attended events yet. I think we had up to about 170 folks at one point. So great work. Um, all right, well, if we have no other questions coming in, I know we're a couple minutes early from finishing, but Mary, I just wanna say thank you so much for a fantastic presentation. Um, these have been really cool, just 
and learning what folks are doing in the field. Uh, and I'll say, folks, please join us for our next event. Um, but otherwise, thank you everybody for attending today. And uh, any questions, please check our website or send us an email.